We will be commencing this event in approximately two more minutes. Please bear with us. Thank you. Ms. Dorit Novak, Director General of Yad Vashem, His Excellency, Ambassador Gil Haskel, Chief of State Protocol at the Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs, members of the diplomatic corps, beloved survivors, honored guests, Yad Vashem colleagues. The Holocaust, the Shoah, was an unprecedented genocide, total and systematic, initiated and perpetrated by Nazi Germany and its collaborators with the aim of annihilating the entire Jewish people, its culture, and its heritage. The Nazis' primary motivation for the Holocaust was their extreme anti-Semitic racist ideology. Between 1933 and 1941, Nazi Germany pursued a policy that dispossessed the Jews under its rule of their rights and their property, followed by the branding and concentration of the Jewish population. This policy gained broad support in Germany and in much of occupied Europe. In 1941, following the German invasion of the Soviet Union, the Nazis and their collaborators launched the systematic mass murder of the Jews. By the end of World War II in Europe, in May of 1945, approximately six million Jews had been murdered. Yad Vashem, the World Holocaust Remembrance Center on the Mount of Remembrance in Jerusalem, is the ultimate source for Holocaust education, documentation, commemoration, and research. Founded by Knesset Law in 1953, Yad Vashem's integrated approach incorporates meaningful educational initiatives, groundbreaking research, and inspirational exhibits. Much of this vital activity takes place online in a range of languages and annually reaches millions of persons around the world. The International Day of Commemoration in memory of the victims of the Holocaust, January 27th, was designated by the United Nations General Assembly in November of 2005. 60 years earlier, on January 27th, 1945, the Red Army entered the Auschwitz-Birkenau death camp and liberated its remaining prisoners, including several thousand Jews. As the world continues to grapple with the COVID-19 pandemic, we are conducting this year's observance of International Holocaust Remembrance Day as an online event, which is also being broadcast live on Yad Vashem's YouTube channel. This is, of course, a departure from our customary annual gathering here on the Mount of Remembrance. It is our fervent hope that on January 27, 2022, we will be able to host you again in person at Yad Vashem in Jerusalem. We open our event today with an address by the President of the State of Israel, His Excellency, Mr. Ruven Ruvi Rivlin. Dear friends, one year ago, we gathered in Yad Vashem But on the other hand, it has reminded us of our common humanity and of the need for all countries to work together to meet this challenge. 
Just like in the fight against the coronavirus, all countries must join hand to defeat the virus of anti-Semitism and radical hate. We must show zero tolerance for all forms of anti-Semitism, racism and extremism in any country, whether in the streets, online or in the halls of power. In the fight against anti-Semitism and racism, we must see all tools we have from research and education to law enforcement. I want to take this opportunity to thank all the governments, parliaments, cities and organizations which have adopted the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism. Unfortunately, anti-Semitism and Holocaust denial continue to, continue to spread. The coronavirus has given rise to more anti-Semitic conspiracy theories, and we have continued to see attacks against synagogues and Jewish institutions. I call all governments and official bodies to adopt the IHRA definition as an important tool in this fight. Dear friends, thank you. Thank you again for your commitment and the commitment of your countries to preserving the memory and lessons of the Holocaust. Let us all work together in the coming year to ensure that the shared promise of never again becomes a shared reality. And once again, thank you. Thank you very much. God bless all of you. Thank you very much, President Rivlin. I am honored to invite the Director General of Yad Vashem, Ms. Dorit Novak, to deliver her remarks. Dear member of the Dip Diplomatic Corps, friends of Yad Vashem, fellow colleagues, shalom and welcome. I am honored to address this gathering from the Mount of Remembrance in Jerusalem. On the occasion of the International Day of Remembrance for the victim, victims of the Holocaust. Greetings on, of, on behalf of Mr. Ronen Plot, Yad Vashem new acting chairman. It is, a, it is significant to note that this year we conduct, we conduct this annual event for the first time since its inception over a decade ago without the participation of Avner Shalev who just recently retired following 27 years of remarkable achievements as a chairman of Yad Vashem Directorate. I know that you all join me in thanking Avner for his unmatched devotion and skills and skill in building and leading Yad Vashem and in furthering Holocaust remembrance worldwide. The heads of the diplomatic mission to Israel will all soon be receiving invitation to the International Virtual Farewell Event in Avner's honor, which will, held, will be held on the 28th of February. We, will, we are waiting to see you all there. I think that any of us who participated in last year event of the International Holocaust Remembrance Day here in Jerusalem, and specifically at Yad Vashem, cannot help but be struck by the dramatic differences of circumstances. As you will recall, on the 23rd of January, 2020, approximately 50 heads of state came together here at Yad Vashem in the fifth World Holocaust Forum to declare the nation's deep commitment to the values and goals of accurate, fact-based, and meaningful remembrance of the Shoah. All agree that it was an unprecedented, unforgettable, and deeply significant experience. The dramatic sights, sounds, and statements of the forum resonate throughout the world. 
They offered hope and encouragement to those of us who work persistently to ensure that the legacy of the victims and the survivors of the Holocaust and of the righteous among the nation is treasured and perpetuated. The potential effect of the gathering was and remain enormous. None of us could have foreseen last January 23rd that faithfully the process of translating the forum potential into substantial action would be challenged and disrupted, like so much else of our human existence. By the pandemic of the COVID-19, which emerged just several weeks afterwards and quickly spread all over the globe. The year 2020 was so different than what any of us envisioned. But some things were not different. If anything, they were further confirmed and proven. Unfortunately, the persistence of the anti-Semitism was one of them. Fortunately, the fundamental relevance of the story of the, and the meaning of the Holocaust was another. As the year 2020 unfolded, we at Yad Vashem together with our allies and friends around the globe reveal once again that highlighting the relevance of the Shoah, while, of, while often difficult, can also be deeply rewarding. By leveraging the advanced technologies that were already at our disposal and which we further developed and adapted, Yad Vashem and its partner were able to maintain and even widen our sphere of con communication, learning and influence. Literally millions of persons in dozens of countries, including the countries that you are representing today, choose to join in many hundreds of events and frameworks that we offered online. Classes, lectures, seminars, symposia, tour, exhibits, chat groups were formed and keep on working, online already readily accessible. At any given moment, around the clock, around the world, hundreds if not thousands of people are engaged in online Yad Vashem activities. The number continue to grow steadily. These activities have been created vibrant, com vibrant communities of remembrance that transcended borders and time zone, that transcended or even the, dis the, the distress of the pandemic in the, in, in the cause of, of morality and tolerance. True. These communities and Yad, Vashem, and Yad Vashem, which inform and inspire them, face considerable obstacles. The world tensions and conflicts, including those reflect, reflecting anti-Semitism and other forms of extreme racism, seem to have grown in this past year. Democracy and human rights seem no stronger than before, yet central message of January 27th is to resist despair over the, world, over the world situation and rather to work for its repair. The survivors of the Holocaust have taught us that even at midst of the darkest moment, there is reason for hope. We thank you for sharing that hope with us. We invite you, your governments and your civil societies to join with us in translating the hope into effective action. No one should try to predict now under which circumstances we will gather next January 27. But I predict on behalf of Yad Vashem that it will be in a world that have gained greater insight into the constructive potential of remembering the Shoah. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Dorit. I am honored to invite His Excellency, Ambassador Gil Haskell, Chief of Protocol at the Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs to deliver his remarks. Thank you very much. Your Excellency, President Ruven, Ruvi Rivlin, Director General of Yad Vashem, Dorit Novak, Excellencies, colleagues, 
members of the diplomatic corps, and most important, dear survivors. First and foremost, I would like to thank Yad Vashem for hosting this event today and to take this opportunity to thank Avner Shalev for his many years of service. On November 1st, 2005, during the 42nd plenary session of the General Assembly of the United Nations, the international community made a crucial decision to commemorate collectively the most horrific man-made tragedy that ever took place in recorded human history, the Holocaust, a Shoah. Up until that day, we, the victims, the Jewish people and the people of Israel, commemorated our tragedy for six decades almost, all alone, covered with our collective grief and with the eternal question arising, why? Why did the fanatic ruler decide to anni annihilate an entire nation? Why and how did he become so popular in his nation and far beyond? Why was the world silent for more than six years while the atrocities took place? Why did God allow this to happen? And why did the millions of innocent victims not fight back enough, even when the intentions of the perpetrators became clear to all? The answers to these questions are complex and partly unexplainable. But one thing is unquestionable. Even if we cannot explain, we can never ever forget. And that is the huge significance of this International Commemoration Day, because only by remembering and commemorating year by year, we will assure ourselves and future generations that this will never repeat itself. And as we often recite in Israel, never again. My father, the late Arya Haskell, was a Holocaust nine-year-old child refugee from Austria. He never liked to speak much of his past and always preferred, like many Holocaust survivors, to live the present and discuss the future. Before he passed away, he sat with my eldest daughter and told her his entire life story, as if he knew that his days were numbered and he wanted to make sure that his story, like the one of many other thousands of children, should be carried on as a warning sign for future generations. My father recalled that one evening in 1938 in Vienna, his hometown, when he was not even nine years old, his beloved mother packed a small case for him with a few of his belongings and toys and told him that the following morning he will be going on his own together with many other children of his age to the shores of England to seek a new destiny, a new future. At the time, Austria was already under Nazi rule and Jewish adults could not leave, including his mother. His father was already uh, detained in a Nazi labor camp in Dachau on the outskirts of Munich in Germany. The following morning, my grandmother escorted my father to the railway station hugged him strongly, kissed him on the forehead, and sent him off. That was the last time my father saw his mother, who was later murdered by the Nazis with their entire community. He kept on saying that if he only knew that that was the last time he would ever see his mother, he would probably have hugged her longer. My father's story is one amongst many, but as tragic and as sad as his story was, he was still among the lucky children who managed to escape the horrific fate of brutal murder and massacre. One and a half million children were not as lucky, and we commemorate them here today. I'm extremely grateful that thanks to the International Day of Commemoration in memory of the victims of the Holocaust and events like this one today, hosted by Yad Vashem, I, like many others in Israel and around the world, can share our very personal and intimate stories with all of you. This year in particular, we witnessed these stories being told in new locations like numerous Gulf countries, Morocco, Sudan, thanks to the Arab Abraham Accords. One thing is clear, the more we tell, less denial will prevail and humanity will improve its ways. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador Haskell, for your touching and meaningful remarks. Yad Vashem's designated yearly theme for Holocaust Remembrance Observance in 2021 is entitled, Until the Very Last Jew, 80 Years Since the Onset 
of mass annihilation. In June 1941, after having defeated Yugoslavia and Greece, Nazi Germany launched a surprise attack on the USSR. Operation Barbarossa was the code name given to the incursion of some 4 million troops from Germany and its allies into Soviet territory. Operation Barbarossa was a milestone in World War II and a turning point in the fate of the Jews. Jewish life that had existed for centuries in Eastern Europe was practically obliterated. Approximately 1 million Jews were murdered within the Soviet Union's pre-war borders and some one and a half million Jews were massacred in the territories annexed by the USSR between 1939 and 1940. The murder of the Jews of the USSR and the annexed territories was a decisive turning point towards the final solution, the systematic annihilation of the Jews by Nazi Germany. A witness to the unfolding of these devastating events was Max Prevler, born in 1931 in the village of Mikulicin, then in Poland, now Ukraine. Mr. Prevler lit one of the six torches of the state opening ceremony of Holocaust Martyrs and Heroes Remembrance Day, Yom HaShoah, at Yad Vashem in 2017. Я родился в Западной Украине. Мой отец Давид Ривлер Гершкович был большой купец. Началась война, гестаповцы арестовывать пришли моего отца. Я обхватил отца за ногу. Начальник жандармерии говорит, берите этого жиденка. Нас раздели, голые шли к месту расстрел. На краю ямы Отец до выстрелов взял, столкнул меня в яму. Падая сам, прикрыл меня своим телом. Когда начали кричать и подниматься раненые, эсэсовцы начали достреливать сверху ям. Под утро я начал шевелиться, увидел небо, выцарапался. Мне было ровно 11 лет. Передали, что мама опухла с голода в гетто. Пришел в гетто, вижу, гонят мою маму с братиками, с сестрой. Полицейский начал срывать у мамы мальчика, Берлика, братика, ему полтора года. Она резко развернулась и с такой силой толкнула этого полицейского, что он ударился об бордюр виском и на месте умер. Собрались полицейские, разорвали Берлика, а маму потащили к жандармерии и спустили веревку со второго этажа и повесили. У меня было только одно в голове – и убивать их, и мстить, и мстить. И вот так я мстил. Я становлюсь секретным разведчиком, и в 14 лет я становлюсь командиром группы отдельной детской разведки. Участник спасения Кракова, освобождения Свенцума. Я видел эти челюсти золотые, я видел эти волосы, я видел эти крематории, эти скелеты, которые не могли шевелиться евреи. Мой отец, он говорит, сынок, если останешься живой, будешь рассказывать людям правду, что делали эти звери с людьми только за то, что они родились евреями. Вот это я и делаю до сих пор. Я богатый человек. У нас шесть правнуков. Внуков у нас пять. Внуки, правнуки служат, государство охраняет. Ну и я какую-то, может быть, еще пользу принесу нашей стране. Yad Vashem is deeply committed to thorough historical study of the annals of the Shoah as the necessary factual foundation for accurate Holocaust remembrance. Sound, unrestricted historical scholarship must be at the core of Holocaust education and commemoration. I'm honored to invite Dr. David Zilberklang, senior historian at Yad Vashem's International Institute for Holocaust Research, 
to deliver today's lecture on the subject, the paths from the mass shootings to the final solution. Thank you very much, Yossi, uh, for the introduction. And uh, thank you for the organizers for sharing this story uh, we just saw, that was quite something. Um, the subject that I want to address, the paths, and I deliberately say it in plural, to, uh, from mass shootings to the final solution, of course, is something that I, could, uh, I teach in the university over a course of uh, uh, a year-long seminar. But I, I want to share certain elements uh, of this with you, and I'm going to show you a few things on the screen first. First of all, the title, as you see, uh, is not just the paths from mass shootings to the uh, final solution. I preface that with a quote from a teenager, Jewish teenager from the Vilna Ghetto, who wrote in the beginning of October 1941, uh, following or in the midst of uh, a roundup on the Yom Kippur, the holiday of Yom Kippur, uh, on the Jewish calendar, a roundup of Jews were being taken out to be shot uh, outside of Vilna. He wrote what essentially was the Jewish perspective on what was happening to them, or one of the main Jewish perspectives. We are like animals, surrounded by the hunter on all sides. And we'll come back to that. And I want to bear that in mind as we progress. But I want to begin uh, the heart of the story, the heart of the, of, of the talk today with this particular story that begins on August the 1st of 1941. On August the 1st, and it actually began a couple of days before and continued a couple of days later, the murder units operating on behalf of Nazi Germany in the area of the Pripyat marshes, uh, or today Pripyat, because it's mostly in Ukraine, uh, an area, vast swampy area that was in Poland before the war and is today in Ukraine and straddles the border into uh, Belarus, the units that were operating there received an order from Heinrich Himmler, and you see it here encapsulated in this quotation from one version of the order. This was being passed on from Heinrich Himmler, commander of the SS, the overall commander of the murder, to the various generals who were uh, leading the murder, and from them to the commanders and the men in the field. All Jewish men should be executed, and the Jewish women and children pushed into the swamps. The uh, executioners, the murderers in the field understood this to include also who should be pushed into the swamps, the elderly and ill people in each community as well. The uh, commanders, or at least many of them, hesitated for a moment when they got this order. Something about it caused them to pause. And they sent back a request to Himmler for clarification. Have they understood correctly? He responded to them, right away, yes, you've understood correctly, carry out the orders, and they proceeded to carry out these orders all along uh, this, this uh, area of the Pripyat marshes. I mean, I'm speaking in a small country uh, in Israel. The Pripyat marshes are an area that is several times the size of the state of Israel, We're talking about a very big area. As they proceeded to round up Jews and kill them, they found that this method of murder didn't work. And as one of the murder commanders, a, uh, an SS uh, uh, major, uh, said a Sturmbahnführer, Franz Magil, a commander of a cavalry unit, as he said in one, of, in one of his reports on August the 12th, the driving of women and children into the marshes did not have the expected success because the marshes were not so deep that one could sink. And after a depth of about a meter, there was in most cases solid ground. That means that the floor of the swamp was not soft and they didn't sink in. And the water was not deep enough preventing complete sinking. This raises a number of questions, this little story I just told. First of all, uh, I could complete that story and say that when they found that drowning the Jews in the swamps was not going to work, and they had to shoot them in the swamps instead of in the way they were doing until then, lining up the Jews neatly and, uh, and uh, shooting them by firing squads. So they went back to the firing squad method and shooting them into pits uh, that were prepared. But we have a number of questions here. First of all, what caused these commanders of the murder units to hesitate? After all, these were, uh, we're talking about uh, commanders who were from the SS and the German police, who were diehard Nazis, leaders of the ideology, 
who had already been murdering people by the thousands for weeks since the beginning of the invasion of the Soviet Union. So now they're being told to kill more people. What caused them to hesitate? And it seems that what caused them to hesitate was the nature of the killing. Who are they killing? And what does it mean, the implication of this killing? Because until that time, late July, early August, most of the murder units had been murdering all across the front from the north, Estonia, and heading into Russia towards Leningrad, and all the way to the south in southern Ukraine and so on. Most of the murder units had been killing selectively. They'd walked into each unit, each Jewish community. They'd rounded up a group of able-bodied young men and community leaders and taken them out and shot them. 50 here, a few hundred there, but they had not been shooting entire communities in most cases. And the, apparently the understanding was get rid of those who could lead opposition and some kind of resistance, the ones who pose a threat. And the women and the children and the elderly and the ill were not viewed as people who could pose an immediate threat. And here they're being told, turn it around. Leave some of those able-bodied young men behind as forced laborers who will provide Germany with some kind of manpower for labor temporarily. And everybody else, the ones you were not killing until now, you are to kill. In other words, they were moving from selective murder by the thousands, tens of thousands, into total murder. And not only in the Pripyat marshes. When we look at the orders that went out and the communications among the murder units, what we see is that from the latter part of July through the latter part of August, all the units gradually moved over, having received the orders appropriately, they moved over to total murder. And that leads to another question. Not only what made these people hesitate, but what did they think that they were doing until then? I mean, they've been killing people by the tens of thousands. So what, what's the difference who they're killing? What made them hesitate here is connected to what did they think that they were involved in? Did they come into the Soviet Union planning to kill all the Jews, begin with these and then move to those? Or maybe something else was going on, which is also connected to the larger question. That is, where do we see and in how, did, how, how did it develop that the Nazis reached a decision to murder all the Jews, everyone that they could get their hands on in that seek and destroy mission to kill all the Jews first in Europe and ultimately in all the world? These are big questions, we can't answer everything here, but I want to uh, go back to uh, the screen and see what we can do about that. And I want to, first of all, say a few words about uh, the run-up to Operation Barbarossa and some of the planning. People have written books that are hundreds of pages long about this, good books and many articles, we can't go into everything. But in the run-up, it's important to point to a number of things. From the moment that Hitler gave the orders to the Wehrmacht, to the German army, to prepare Operation Barbarossa, that was in December 1940, what we see is almost immediately, when we look at the documents, almost immediately, the discourse among leading uh, Nazi officials, whether they are uniformed in the military, the police or the SS, or they're civilians in, in government service of one sort or another, the discourse became murderous, strikingly so. That what they're going into the Soviet Union to do is going to be something that is massively murderous and the discourse is far more murderous even than the discourse when they, invent, when they invaded Poland in 1939 when the discourse was quite murderous and the action was quite murderous of course. But here they're talking about something much bigger apparently. And we know that the SS, the ideological army of the Nazi party and the Wehrmacht, the German armed forces negotiated an agreement in March 1941, dividing up their jurisdiction in the territories that would be occupied. But it wasn't just a division of labor, you do this and you do that. It was also an agreement on how they were going to cooperate and a recognition by the Wehrmacht that the SS had been given by Hitler what they called special tasks. That's one of the code words for murdering Jews. And the, S, the, the Wehrmacht agreed to lend logistic assistance to the SS, maps, vehicles, whatever, but also where possible to give them manpower to help carry out uh, the murder, which they did wherever possible. 
we know that from the end of March 1941, in a talk that Hitler gave to the top generals of the Wehrmacht and all around all these circles I mentioned that were preparing the invasion, the talk became a discussion of a Vernichtungskrieg, a war of extermination. They were talking about exterminating the Soviet Union as an entity, as a political entity, as a country. But connected to that was discussion of how many people will need to die. And they're talking about the necessity of killing large numbers of people, especially Jews. We know that the murder units, the Einsatzgruppen, those special mobile task forces began training in mid-May of 1941, but so too did many other kinds of units from the German police, from the SS, from the Waffen SS, all of these began training in May of 1941, and they were prepared when Operation Barbarossa began to enter the frame to begin uh, murdering Jews and others who were on their agenda. And we know that on June 17th of 1941, Heydrich, Reinhard Heydrich, one of the most important deputy commanders in the SS under Himmler, and the man who was overall in charge of all of these murder units, and later in charge of many other things in the, in the murder of the Jews, he came to their training camp at Pretsch and he gave them a pep talk. And according to the uh, testimonies post-war of a number of the officers who were at, the, uh, at that pep talk, Heydrich spoke explicitly about killing all the Jews, that this is what they're going out to do. But some of those people who were there and testified didn't remember exactly if he talked about killing Jews or killing the Jews, that is all or some, but clearly that was part of it. Now on the map, you, you, what you see here is the advance of the Einsatzgruppen who entered literally on the heels of the German army. When the German army invaded the Soviet Union and, Bar and Operation Barbarossa, they literally entered on their heels. The first murder began the day after the invasion that began, began the first massive murder. And the four Einsatzgruppen, A, B, C, D, as you see on the map, were divided. A in the north, B and C in the center, D in the south. But more units entered the fray right after that. And if you just remember this map and you see they advanced rapidly, they crossed following the German armed forces, they crossed the pre-1939 Soviet-Polish border within a few weeks so that they advanced so rapidly that although they were killing by the tens of thousands, they actually left many Jews alive behind because they're racing ahead to kill more and more right behind the front lines. And then later they came back, moving westward again to kill more Jews. I mean, that's the, how the process developed. Who were these murderers? I'm going to point out just an, a number of the different kinds of units to give a sense of what we're talking about. The four Einsatzgruppen we already mentioned, the specially trained mobile task forces. A fifth Einsatzgruppe was raised from among the German SS and police in the general government of Poland. The name the Nazis gave to the part of Poland that they did not annex, but rather treated sort of like an occupied area that they were devastating, including the areas of Warsaw, Krakow, Lublin, et cetera. So another 500 men entered. And unlike the other four Einsatzgruppen that each had a kind of geographical assignment, north or center or south, this one was meant to fill in gaps and help out wherever help was needed. In addition to that, Police battalions, the Orpo, Ordnungspolizei, the police battalions mechanized that have been training since May of 1941 began entering a few days after these murder units entered. By the end of August of 1941, there were 23 police battalions. By the end of 1941, there were 26 police battalions, more than 15,000 additional men out there killing Jews. In addition to that, Himmler created in May of 1941 a division out of the SS and the police, commanded by himself. He wanted to use them as a kind of special group that he could send for special missions. But their first special mission was to kill Jews along with all these other murder units. He called it Kommandostab Reichsführer SS, that he's the Reichsführer SS, so it's his division. 
And they participated, according to their own records, which have survived, they participated in the murder of more than 100,000 Jews by the beginning of October 1941. Other units of the Waffen-SS and the Wehrmacht and more entered the fray. So what we're looking at is massive numbers of killers from the Third Reich that entered, but they're not the only ones. In addition to them, there were all sorts of self-created units and German-created units from among the indigenous population. Not all the indigenous populations, but from among the indigenous populations, there were people who joined. First of all, those who called themselves partisans, that is pro-Nazi partisans, not like the survivor whom we saw before, an anti-Nazi partisan. They're partisans who were going to help defeat the Soviet army, shoot them in the back as they retreat if necessary, help take over the territories that Germany was entering, and they looked upon Germany as liberators. And part of what they saw as their obligation from their own nationalist perspective was to murder as many Jews as possible, who they blamed for all sorts of terrible things, such as uh, helping the Soviets. Among those who joined the Nazis were renegades from the Red Army, people who had uh, been taken prisoner and switched sides. The Nazis themselves created what they called Schutzmannschaften, mobile auxiliary battalions, from among these POWs primarily. And these mobile uh, auxiliary battalions were primarily uh, ethnically homogeneous, a Ukrainian unit, a Latvian unit, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. By the end of 1941, there were 33,000 local men in these units. By the end of 1942, more than a quarter million. More than a quarter million. And one of their main jobs is to help kill Jews. In addition to that, all sorts of local police from the indigenous population. The Germans didn't police every occupied country in Europe or in North Africa on their own. They relied on local police that they would oversee. But local police did the job. And here too, and the local police and militias are involved in the killing, deeply involved. In addition to that, all sorts of well-organized ultra-nationalist movements that wanted to liberate their country. And as part of that, they saw that part of what they needed to do was to kill as many Jews as they could, such as the or Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists, the OUN in Ukraine, or the Lithuanian Activist Front in Lithuania, or other similar kinds of groups in various places. So when we look at who's involved in the murder, it's all led and organized by Nazi Germany, but they found very many local helpers who were eagerly willing to do this. Now I want to relate for a few minutes to six parallel tracks of development. I talked about paths to the final solution. I want to point to some of those paths. And I just outlined them here, the paths of independent allies of Germany that killed on their own, Romania and Croatia, the movement in the USSR to total murder, the development of gas fans, what happened with the Jews of the Third Reich in this same time in history, end of summer, beginning of autumn, 1941, the development of Auschwitz-Birkenau and the role of Odilo Globocznik, we'll, mention, we'll explain him in a few moments, and the uh, Operation Reinhardt. First, uh, in a photo. We know that Romania, in terms of the number of troops sent in, I guess he referred to some 4 million troops that entered the Soviet Union. The bulk of them were German. But the second largest army by far was Romanian, which with about half a million troops that entered the fray. And the Romanian uh, militias and Romanian gendarmerie and Romanian soldiers, as they progressed, retaking territories that the Soviet Union had annexed in 1940 and moving into territory that had never been Romania, crossing the border into pre-war Soviet Union in Ukraine, the Romanians murdered on their own massive numbers of Jews. The estimates vary from somewhere in the vicinity of 300,000 or just under that to somewhere in the vicinity of 400,000 or just over that. I'm not the expert on Romania to tell you who's closer to the truth, but that gives you a sense of, of the magnitude of the murder undertaken by the Romanian regime and their armed forces then. The scene you see here is at the beginning of that murder in the city of Yash, 
at the end of June of 1941, where some 13, 14,000 Jews were killed within a few days. And I am showing you a photograph that is one of the least gory, uh, sparing you the goriness in this case, although the next one doesn't spare us that. We know that when we talk about moving in, in the Soviet Union, this is a scene from Ukraine, one of the killing pits in Ukraine, moving into total murder in the Soviet territories meant killing women and children. This is a, uh, a scene inside of one of the murder pits of women who were shot. The men you see there with rifles are local people, uniformed uh, militias who are doing the shooting in this case, in this particular scene. The women have been stripped of their clothing. You don't waste good clothing. One of the motivations for many of the local killers is to make use of the things the Jews have, including their clothing, which we'll come back to in a moment. And here you see that the man standing and pointing his rifle in the center of the picture is aiming at a woman who's up on her elbows. That is, they're going to confirm the death. Someone survived the shooting, they'll go back and kill that person. Or here, a quotation from a Polish journalist who lived on the outskirts of Vilnius, of Vilna, and kept a diary. He didn't survive the war, Kazime Sakowicz. And he uh, lived right on the road from Vilnius to the murder site, Ponar or Panire. And he, uh, we'll call just a couple of sentences from the diary to see what he was seeing, how he understood things, how things were developing. July 23rd, it's a nice day. About 500 people are transported, executions until late. Since July the 14th, he says, the victims have been stripped to their underwear, brisk business and clothing. So one of the motivations, and here the killers are Lithuanians. He points that out over and over and over again. So here, one of the motivations of the local killers is a brisk business in clothing. August 1941. For the Germans, 300 Jews are 300 enemies of humanity. For the Lithuanians, are 300 pairs of shoes, trousers, and the like. Or he goes on on September 2nd, a major murder operation in Vilna that was the beginning of putting the Jews of Vilna into a ghetto. And he's upset by what, he, 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 by what he's watching. The way they shot, the group of shooters stood on the corpses, which you saw on that picture from Ukraine as well. They walked on the bodies. The bodies were immediately covered over the next day. There were many wounded. Then he talks about those who escaped, who weren't killed and went back to Vilna. We have Jewish accounts of that also in the diary of Hermann Krupp, who met some of these women. In the testimony at the Eichmann trial of Mark Mayer Dvorzhetsky, who was a physician who treated one of these women and went to tell the community about it, what's going on, but who could believe this? And what do they do when they find a child who survived? Of course, they shoot him. Carl Yeager, the SS colonel, who was uh, the commander of the murder in Lithuania, wrote a summary report at the end of the job on December 1st, 1941, saying that by the end of November, they had killed more than 137,000 Jews in Lithuania, the first place where more or less the job had been completed, the first country. And to say, he says, today I can confirm that our objective to solve the Jewish problem for Lithuania has been achieved by Einsatzkommando 3, a subunit of Einsatzgruppe A. In Lithuania, there are no more Jews apart from Jewish workers and their families. And he goes on to say, and those workers, we should sterilize them. But if despite sterilization, a Jewess, a female Jew becomes pregnant, she'll be liquidated. It's clear what's gonna to happen to those Jews. So this is, that's murder becoming total. But one of the questions we have to ask in understanding the paths to the final solution, if we see that Romania and Croatia also by the summer of 1941 were killing Jews in their hands on their own without German intervention. And in the Soviet Union during the second half of the summer of 41, the murder became total murder of the Jews as we saw in the Pripyat Marshes, as we see in Lithuania, and it continued that way. What about German planning for other places? And here I want to point to a number of things. What you're looking at is one of the gas vans, right? And 
Uh, we know that Walter Rauf, another SS officer, was appointed to organize the development of a gas vehicle. He wasn't the mechanic who's going to design the vehicle, but rather he was going to organize the operation to turn to various automobile companies under German control and have them design until they get the best design. They got the design completed by the end of September uh, or beginning of October of 1941, did various test runs. And following that, the first death camp began to be constructed, Chelno, on around November the 1st of 1941. And its method of murder was going to be this. And Chelno is in the part of Poland that was annexed by Germany. So this is already a sign that the murder, as they're planning the gas vans, during the course of the planning, the planning for murder of Jews has now come to include at least a big part, if not all, of the Polish Jews, because they're building a death camp at Chelmno. In addition to that, we know that in Auschwitz, the planning to expand what had been a concentration camp for political prisoners, most of them Poles initially, and, uh, and other kinds of prisoners, the expansion into a much larger camp to include Auschwitz II, Birkenau, and Auschwitz III, the industrial area at Monowitz, all that began in the spring of 1941. Rudolf Hess, the commandant of Auschwitz, testified after the war that he spoke with Himmler in the summer. He was summoned by Himmler, and Himmler told him to begin preparing Auschwitz for uh, the function of becoming the main killing center for the Jews of Europe. And we see that in the fall of 1941, the Polish farmers and villagers in this 40 square kilometer area that was being taken over by the Auschwitz complex were kicked out and then preparations began. But while that's going on, we also know that on September 3rd, 1941, the first experimental gassing was undertaken at Auschwitz. The victims were Soviet prisoners of war. The method of murder was not a gas vehicle or shooting, but Cyclone B, Zyklon B, the, the uh, pesticide that was, became the method of murder at Auschwitz for the overwhelming majority of those who were killed. And we know that by October 15th of 1941, we already have from the company that went on to build gas chambers, one of the companies, a blueprint for the gas chamber and crematorium on October 15th of 1941. So there's movement there. And I mentioned Odilo Globochnik. Odilo Globochnik was the SS and police commander of the Lublin district in the general government of Poland. He ultimately became the leader, the commander of what came to be known as Operation Reinhard, which was the operation to murder all the Jews of the general government, which the Nazis estimated at more than 2 million Jews. They also killed Jews from other places, but this is where it began. And Globochnik was very close to Himmler. He also was very well organized, very creative in his evil and in his murderous capacity. And he had foresight to see where things might be going. So as the murder got underway in the Soviet Union, he made sure that he put some of his most trusted men, officers and non-commissioned officers into that fifth Einsatzgruppe that went into the Soviet Union and had them report back to him. Tell me what's going on. And they did. And all of them that came out of Lublin under his command and had gone into the Soviet Union in the summer, all of them ended up taking up major central positions in what came to be known as Operation Reinhardt. He also sent in men to do other kinds of work and they too participated in murder of Jews. He turned to Ed, university educated men under his command and gave them a problem. He said, if we were to want to kill Jews here, how would you do it? And they sat and they discussed and came back to him with a plan. They said, if you want to kill Jews here, what you need to do is not have the murderers chase the victims or bring the victims to the murderers. Set up some kind of killing installation, a secret camp that has to be near or on a rail line to make it easy to transport but it must be top secret. None of this shooting and running around chasing after people because that's much too public and that defeats the purpose. It's also difficult for the murderers, but how will you kill them? 
And for that, he got input from what the Nazis called the euthanasia program, code named T4. And one of the security commanders for Operation T4, which was suspended temporarily in mid-August 1941, Christian Wirth, an SS officer, came in the fall of 1941 to Lublin and consulted with Globochnik and gave him the idea of carbon monoxide gas. Globochnik also seized the opportunity to take POWs, Soviet POWs, out of POW camps that were not far from Lublin and offer them the opportunity to switch sides. And we know that between July of 1941 and May of 1943, around 5,000 men took that opportunity. One of them is one who uh, most of us have heard of, right? Of course, Ivan Demyanyuk, who ended up in Sobibor. He was one of those POWs. So 5,000 in groups of a few hundred at a time going through training. In other words, he's building a private army for whatever he might want to do. Now he has people training, people with murder experience, a plan and a method of murder. And he went to Himmler in October 1941, and he got the green light from Himmler, his boss, and around November the 1st of 1941, the first of the camps of the operation he was going to command began to be constructed, Belgians. It was completed in February 42, more complicated than Chelmno. Chelmno began operating December 8th of 41. It was easy to build because all you needed were the vehicles. Here, you had to build gas chambers and places to dispose the bodies and so on, much more complicated. And then the other camps of Sobibor Treblinka began being built later in 1942. Another parallel track. If we have different people within Germany looking to expand, let me go back a little before I do that, looking to expand the murder beyond the Soviet Union, whether it's Chelmno and that method of murder or Auschwitz or Globochnik, we also have discussions inside of Germany beginning in the latter part of August of 1941 to begin deporting the Jews of the Third Reich eastward, apparently to join the fate of the Jews in the East. The East is the Soviet Union. The deportations were meant to begin in, in mid-September. They were postponed for various technical reasons and they began in mid-October. The first deportations went to Poland, to the Lodz Ghetto, but the subsequent deportations in 41 did indeed send thousands of Jews from the Third Reich into the Soviet Union. And many of them were killed right away in Minsk, in Riga, in Kaunas, Kovno, and so on. So we have thinking about including the Third Reich in the murder, the Jews of the Third Reich. And here the uh, infamous letter from Hermann Goering, the second most powerful man in Germany at that time, and the man whose uh, functions included the overall command of all policy regarding Jews, under Hitler, of course, but he's the overall uh, person in charge. And Heydrich, whom we've already encountered, came to him in July 41, saying, in order for me to do the things we're talking about, I need a new authorization from you. This is that authorization. I'll just look at the last sentence. I further charge you with submitting to me promptly an overall plan of the preliminary organizational, practical, and financial measures for the execution of the intended final solution of the Jewish question. July 31st, 1941. Is this a reflection of a decision on the final solution? Most historians agree, I among them, that this was not yet the decision, but rather a reflection of discussions that are underway. We're killing them all in the Soviet Union. What else can we do? And this is a, an authorization to carry out a feasibility study. If we do this, what does it mean? What is involved? How do we do it? What does it cost? Heydrich came back to Goering in mid-November 1941 with the results of his research. The actual document he had compiled of here's the plan or here's the feasibility study has not survived, or at least it has not yet been found in an archive, but the cover note was found. The cover note saying, following on your letter, July 31st, here's my report. But we don't know what the report said exactly. We do know that Heydrich after that got the green light from Hitler via Goering to convene a meeting that would discuss the final solution. We know that in December, there was a great deal of discussion among the most senior Nazis 
about the upcoming final solution. Here's just one illustration. Joseph Goebbels, the propaganda minister, writing in his diary on December 13th, 1941, about a meeting he attended the day before of senior Nazi officials with Hitler. And he says, with respect to the Jewish question, the fear has decided to make a clean sweep. He prophesied to the Jews that if they again brought about a world war, they would live to see their annihilation in it. That wasn't just a catchword. The world war is here. In other words, the US has entered the war. Now there's a world war. And the annihilation of the Jews must be the necessary consequence. And there are other speeches and documents from senior Nazis around the same time saying is more or less the same thing. The Von Zee conference that we all are familiar with convened in the end, not when it was scheduled originally, December 9th. It had to be postponed because of the US entering the war. It convened on January 20th, 1942, as we know. And this document that we're all familiar with was part of the background material that participants received. That is, how many Jews are there in each place? And I just want to point out two things. One is the division between Group A and Group B. Group A, places and countries, territories already under German control. Group B, those territories and countries that are not yet under German control, including allies of Germany like Bulgaria, Croatia, etc countries that where the war is going on, the Soviet Union, and countries that are neutral, uh, Spain, Sweden, Switzerland, all are to be included in this final solution that they're discussing. How many Jews will be killed? More than 11 million. I want to conclude with a reflection on the Jews in all of this. From the beginning of the war, and especially from the beginning of the murder, Jews were struggling to understand what do the Nazis want and where is this going? Because if they can understand where it's going, maybe they can understand what they should try to do about it. But of course, when the murder was underway, Jews had in various places some information moving from Vilna to other places or Bialystok and other places, but it was limited information, confusing information. And by the time for the Jews in Vilna, Bialystok, or other places, by the time they got the information, most of them are dead. It's only the survivors, some of them, who get this information, and some of it is conflicting. They're working in a forced labor camp, or they're killed, or they were resettled somewhere else. They're also experiencing German deception. They're also experiencing significant numbers of their neighbors turning on them. It doesn't have to be all their neighbors turning on them to make it something that is inescapable but there were significant numbers of their neighbors in very many places turning on them, which is where that quote is coming from that we began with, Yitzhak Ludashevsky. We are like animals surrounded by the hunter on all sides. The hunter is not only the Germans. The hunter is their neighbors, their fellow citizens of their country who know how to speak to them, know what they look like, know who the Jews are and know where to find them. There were massive attempts by Jews at hiding and escaping. Hundreds of thousands hid or fled individually or in groups. Some of them survived. The overwhelming majority of them did not. I'd like to conclude with the story of this little place I've uh, written on the bottom of the slide called Yanishuv. This is an illustration of what we're talking about. Yanishuv was a small forced labor camp that existed for a brief time, for several months altogether in 1942. In, in today's borders of Poland, it would be in Southeastern Poland. And our story begins on November the 6th of 1942. There were 600 Jewish men who worked in this forced labor camp and they worked only in day work. There was no nighttime job. November 6th, Friday night, 1942, they're in their barracks organizing a little bit of food, whatever they have, and getting ready to go to bed. And as they're doing all this, they suddenly hear screaming outside in Yiddish, Yidin Ratovitzich, Jews save yourselves. Then they heard shooting. Then the shooting stopped, and they hear again in Yiddish, Yidin Kimtarois, Jews come out. 
And as these 600 Jewish men hesitatingly came out of their barracks, afraid, not knowing what happened, what did they see? A partisan unit of 18 men had stormed the camp. They were commanded by someone who had been an inmate in this camp and had fled several weeks earlier. He had meanwhile joined a partisan unit, Polish partisan unit that was actually under communist commands, more or less. And the unit that, that came and, and attacked this camp, 18 men, 15 or 16 of them were Jews, and the others were Soviet POWs who had escaped the POW camp. They had killed all the guards. As the prisoners watched, they executed the commandant in the square of the camp. And then the commander, a man named Yoshua, turned to 600 Jews and said, you're free, you're liberated. And then he took 10 of them with him, which is the number he's allowed to take, and he went back to his partisan encampment. When he reached his partisan encampment, the commander of the unit had all of his men disarmed and had all of them, the 18 and the 10 they brought with them, shot. And apparently, he was both an anti-Semite and was afraid of competition for command. What happened to the other 600? What did they do? What do 600 liberated Jews do in November 1942? Well, apparently, according to the survivor accounts, about 440 of them escaped and ran to the woods or people they know. But about 160 of them stayed behind, be, apparently because at least some of them were not even Polish Jews. They had been deported from Germany or Austria or, or Czech Republic, and they didn't know the language or the area. Or they were from other parts of Poland and didn't know their way around. Or maybe they were just afraid. But they couldn't just sit there, ransacked warehouses, escaped Jews, dead Germans. So they reached a logical conclusion. They appointed a delegation of a couple of men led by a German speaking Polish Jewish doctor named Dr. Gross, whose job it was to go to the nearest police outpost and report what happened. And they did that. And they were told by the police, we have the German police report has survived and we know what they said. And they were told, go back and wait until the morning and people will come and tell you what to do. And the next morning, an SS unit came together with a unit of uniformed Polish firefighters, rounded these Jews up and marched them to the nearest town, a number of kilometers away. Whoever stumbled or didn't walk fast enough, they shot. Around 50 of them were shot, just like the death marches at the end of the war. The rest of them, around 110, were put on vehicles and driven to a forced labor camp called Budzin. The commandant of Budzin was reputed among his own German colleagues to be one of the most sadistic, vicious SS men around. Some of these 110 survived that camp and subsequent camps. What happened to the 440? Well, a hunt went out after them. German police, Polish police, local people, and within a few weeks, all had been caught and killed, except one. That one was a man named Label. He had fled. Together with around 30 of his buddies from the camp, they dug some kind of large foxhole in the woods and they hid. And their arrangement was every couple of days at night, someone would go out and try to get supplies. Came his turn, he went out to get supplies. He came back under the cover of darkness and he found that all of his 30 comrades had been murdered. Not only were they murdered, though, whoever killed them had stripped them naked and hacked their bodies to pieces. From that, he drew the conclusion that the people who killed them are not the Germans. It's local people. He's a hunted animal. And he's alone. So what does a hunted animal alone with no chance to survive do? He reached a logical conclusion. He walked to Budzin and turned himself in. And the commandant, that sadistic, vicious SS man, let him in. And in the end, the only one who survived of all the escapees of a liberated camp was the one who turned himself in. Now, why do I tell this strange story? I tell it to point to two things. First of all, Jews who did everything they could to try to survive. But on the other hand, all the cards and the Jews' fate were held by the Germans and their collaborators. And in the development of the final solution, that too is what the Jews had to contend with in the impossible odds that they faced. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, David, for that very, very uh, important and compelling lecture. Before we conclude today's event, we would like to take this opportunity to invite you all to participate in Yad Vashem's unique online commemorative project, the I Remember Wall. Each Holocaust victim has a story and each of us can and should be an ambassador of memory with the responsibility to serve as the voice for those who were murdered. A link to this special project is being forwarded to you all today by email. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it was our honor to host you at this virtual event. We look forward to welcoming you again soon in person and in good health on the Mount of Remembrance in Jerusalem with your colleagues, family, and friends, as together we enhance our shared commitment to meaningful and accurate Holocaust remembrance. Thank you and Shalom.